The Boolean variable is not something that we think about too often. Used primarily to control the access and flow of certain features, it's a variable we've become very complacent with. I think that it has some limitations when it comes to more complex systems, and because of this, I actually like to use lists as a way to control access to features. Here I have a character object. On the left side is our create event, and on the right side is our step event. To demonstrate this problem, we are going to focus primarily on input control. So on the left side, I'm going to create a method called jump pressed. This method will just act as a wrapper for a standard keyboard check. Now in our step events, I'm going to implement this method if jump pressed and then we will do our jump. Now this seems fine, but there are circumstances in which we may want to prevent jumping from being able to happen. Some of these examples may be things like a pause menu, a jump cooldown timer, maybe something like environmental hazard, or maybe an item that the character is carrying. There's a whole list of potential reasons why we may want to restrict jumping and the input associated to it. So what I will do is I will create another method called jump check. And for now, I will just have this return true. In our step event, I will say if jump check and jump pressed, then we do our jump. This seems great. Now I'm going to change our jump check method. So as I mentioned prior, there are several reasons we may not allow jumping to happen. This may be that a menu is open or that a jump cooldown timer is running or that a stun is applied or maybe some sort of environmental hazard. So these are a bunch of different reasons that may restrict our jump from happening. So if I were to start to build out this jump check method, it might look something like this. Return obj menu is closed and jump cooldown timer equals zero and jump is stunned equals false and not place meeting obj hazard. As you can see, this return conditional is already growing quite large. And for any other future circumstance that we encounter, we would also have to add that into this implementation. So while we only have four conditional parameters in this example, it's not hard to imagine a situation in which we may have six or 10 or 12 different values that we have to check against in order to validate this jump action. So right away, this solution is not very scalable. Additionally, what we are doing is we are tightly connecting these parameters to this interaction. So we have to consider how OBJ menu is going to handle itself, how our cooldown timer is going to function, how our stun behavior is going to function. We have to consider how our collision with objects in the world is going to function. And then we have to consider the interactions among themselves. So not only is this not very scalable, but it's not very stable either. We have a very fragile relationship between these four conditions. Any one of these conditions changing may affect the entire return value of this conditional method. So this solution is not very scalable and it's not very stable. And additionally, it also breaks some rules when it comes to the role of responsibility. Like, does it really make sense that our character is checking for whether or not our menu is open? This seems a little bit beyond the scope of our character object. So let's go ahead and talk about a better way to implement this. Let's start by adding a private section. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to use a list to control our jump access. Let's start by adding a list. And in this case, I'm just going to use an array called jump locks. Now I am calling this array jump locks because I want this array to represent a list of locks that I am storing. So if I want to prevent jumping, I am going to lock it. And if I want to allow jumping, then I'm going to unlock it. And so the way that we will check to see if we can jump is if we don't have any locks defined in our list. So I'm going to change jump check to say return array length of jump locks is equal to zero. So we can jump if we have not locked our jumping. And if we've unlocked our jumping entirely, then we will allow jumping. So let's add a couple more methods. Let's say jump lock, and this is going to take a lock name. Now I will simply push this lock name into our jump locks array. But I should first check to make sure that this lock doesn't already exist inside of our array. So I will say if array get index, of jump locks lock name is equal to negative one. 
Here, I will also add another method called jump unlock. This will take a lock name as well. And now the idea here is I want to remove this lock from our array. So first I will find the index by saying index is array get index. I will first check to see that index is not equal to negative one. And then I will say array delete jump locks index of one. So now when I say character dot jump lock, I will pass in a lock name and that will store it in our array. And then when I say jump unlock, I will pass in a lock name and that will remove it from the array. So all we're doing is we're simply adding and removing these values to our locks array. And as long as that array is empty, then we will allow a jump to happen. So let me go ahead and collapse these so we can kind of take a look at what we have here. So in our previous implementation, we had this thing where we were checking to see, you know, if obj menu is open is false, right? Then we would allow jumping. So the question is now, how would we implement something like this with the new solution that we have? So I'm just gonna pretend that I'm inside of our obj menu create event here. I'm not gonna create another object for it, but let's just pretend that we're inside of our obj menu create here. So what I will do is I'm gonna create a method called open. And this open method inside of our menu would do things like set visible is equal to true and any other logic we would want to associate with this. But now what we can do is inside of this, we can say with obj character and we can say jump lock. And so now we have to pass in a name for our lock. For this implementation, I like to give the lock names a name that is associated with the context in which it is added. So what I mean by that is our lock would be called something like menu opened. So now when we open our menu, we do all of our menu opening logic. And then after that, we add this lock to all of our characters. So now that means we have to unlock the movement, right? So we're gonna have a close method inside of our menu. This will do things like set visible is false and more close logic. And then we will also say with obj character, jump unlock and we'll pass in the same name, right? Because we want to remove this lock that we added. So when we open the menu, we say, hey, add this lock. It's gonna be called menu opened. When we close the menu, we wanna say unlock this lock called menu opened because it's the lock name we added in. We need to remove that lock name out. Now, this is a very specific implementation for just jumping, and this is kind of a weird one. Now, to make this example more realistic, what I would actually do is I would not have this do jump locking, right? Because it's kind of weird to have our menu lock our jump. Instead, what I would do is I would have this actually called input lock, and this would be input locks. And let's go ahead and update our name here. Right, so now what I'm doing is I wanna think of this as restricting input at kind of more of a higher level. So not just jumping, but all input. And coming from our menu, this actually makes sense, right? Because when I open a menu, I want to restrict all input that might be getting fed to the character and have that input be consumed by the menu instead. So coming down to our menu object, you know, I would change this to be input lock and input unlock. And then now I might add a new method called input check and I would return array length of input locks is equal to zero. Okay, same thing. We're just changing the name from jump locks to input locks. And then inside of our jump check, I would return input check. So what I've done is I just generalized the solution. I've taken everything that we did and I just changed it from being a very specific context of jumping and I've generalized it to input. In fact, this solution I use in all of my projects. So let me go ahead and show a real example of it. this is from my Ludum Dare entry for LD54. So this is a real project with a real implementation of everything that we just went over. So if I take a look at our car object, right? So in the game, you play as a car. So our car object is our character object. If I take a look at our input, I can scroll down here and we can see that we have this input lock section or I can say input lock set, input lock remove. So here you can see we have the general methods. And if I open this up, right? So I'm setting the lock. So I have our input locking on the right side for our car. So here on the left, I have a time controller and this controls things like the time for the round and the countdown timer. So if I open up the countdown method, we can see that we trigger a state change in our finite state machine. So let me go ahead and open up our countdown state. And here I broadcast out that our countdown started. And if I open up our car, I can see that when this countdown started is broadcasted, I am locking my input. 
In fact, you can see that the car actually listens to a lot of broadcast events and all of these events handle input locking and unlocking. So when the countdown starts, I remove a waiting lock and I add a new countdown start lock. When the countdown's finished, I remove that countdown started lock. When the round is started, I remove a round finish locked. When the round is finished, I add a round finish lock. So what I'm able to do is I'm able to add all of these very specific context sensitive locks and remove those locks whenever it's appropriate. And I don't have to worry about these conditional conflicts that might happen rather than have a conditional check that says if X and if Y and if Z and if A and if B, I'm able to just simply check is our lock list empty? And if it is, then we say, good, we're good to go. And if it's not, then we assume that we're locked and all of the locks get added in and removed out whenever it's appropriate. And I don't have to care about any sort of interaction between the locks because they're all context sensitive to themselves. There's going to be a part two to this video where I go over my very specific lock stack implementation. In that video, we will write out this class together and I will show some extra functionality that I've added to it, like the ability to lock it for a certain amount of time. I encourage you to try to think of ways that you can implement this in your project. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. I will see you in the next video where we will write this IB lock stack class together.